This morning's sermon text is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you, and in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. By great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love. By truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as the children, widen your hearts also. Well, God has been so kind to uh, send us a lot of new faces uh, in our church in, in recent months. Maybe you, you've noticed. Um, it could be that uh, some of you are, are new to the faith. Maybe you're exploring Christianity for the first time. And I thought I would, I would just say, maybe you don't have a Bible at home, and it would be our joy. You see the Bibles under the chairs in front of you. Uh, take one of those home with you. That would bless us to offer that to you uh, today. Well, as we parachute back into 2 Corinthians, we need to get our bearings. Remember, the church there had actually turned away from Paul, and it broke his heart. He, he wrote them a severe letter calling for their repentance. Uh, he sends Titus to check on them, and they joyfully receive Titus. Uh, they had uh, since disciplined a man who was likely uh, leading the opposition against Paul. But still, all is not well in Corinth, as we'll see more clearly in chapters 10 and 11. The church still maintained an alliance with a group of false teachers that uh, they didn't want to have anything to do with Paul whatsoever. They claimed to be apostles themselves, and they didn't want anything to do with Paul. These men had a powerful influence on the church, and it was a real threat to the faith of this church, having these, these guys around. Because if you're ashamed of Paul, you will be ashamed of Christ. That's the implication. Paul was an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. That's how he introduces himself in the letter. He was commissioned by Jesus himself to be a minister of the new covenant. Uh, to accept the gospel is to accept the apostle. To reject the gospel that Paul preaches is to reject the gospel of Christ. The stakes are that high. So Paul, he dearly loves these people. And so in our passage this morning, he appeals to them to be reconciled to God, to, to receive the grace of God. And he will commend his own life and ministry to this church, which is really a commendation of his Lord. Paul couldn't conceive of his life apart from Christ. He said to live is Christ. Well, you see the title of my sermon there in the bulletin, Com Commending Christ Through a Cruciform Life. Cruciform, that's not a word we use in everyday conversation. It simply means cross-shaped. A lot of old churches are cruciform in their design. They're, they're shaped like the cross. But a life can be cruciform as well. It, it, it's really the Christian life. A life that makes much of Jesus Christ, a life that is centered on him, animated by him, governed by him, a life that embodies and points to his death and resurrection. 
A cruciform, a cruciform life commends a crucified Savior. That's why Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. To be a follower of Christ means to live a life patterned after his, which necessarily entails suffering. There's a dying to self. There's serving others at your own expense, losing your life for Jesus' sake, and then finding it. Paul was not ashamed of a crucified Savior. His very life bore testimony to that. But he's not sure if the Corinthians have the same conviction. He's troubled over them. They're, they're easily enamored with worldly success and wealth and flashy public personalities. Just doesn't fit with following a crucified Messiah. So this was Paul's burden for this church. He writes, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So I've, I've got six observations in this text of Paul's own cruciform life that he holds out to these people. And the question I'm trying to answer is, how should we live a life that magnifies Jesus Christ in our ministry to others? So number one, work together with God. Paul is bold to say he and his fellow ministers are working together with God in their ministry to the Corinthians. He wants them to know that. Just a few sentences before, he says that God is making his appeal through us. Now, that should startle you, uh, that God would have us work with him in this, this calling others to receive the grace of God, to be reconciled to God. I mean, clearly, he doesn't, he doesn't need us. Paul says, uh, he says uh, elsewhere, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. God is in need of nothing. And yet he has chosen to use you and I, like Paul, as ministers of a new covenant, appealing to unbelievers and one another as occasion arises to receive the grace of God. I wonder if that's hit you, the reality of that. Have you ever stopped to consider the immense privilege and responsibility that is yours as a Christian? to work together with God. The honor of it, the, the joy of it, the, the duty of it, the, the holy obligation that we have. I think in the seemingly ordinary conversations we have with each other where we call one another to faithfulness in, in Christ, you know, away from sin, away from lies and deceit and the schemes of the devil... It is not an exaggeration to say that we are touching eternity in those conversations. Things of eternal consequence are happening because you are working with God. Supernatural things are happening and battles are being waged in the spiritual realm as God makes his appeal through you. I hope this makes you sit up on the edge of your seat to ready yourself to be useful to the master of the house. Paul says in the last chapter, we make it our aim to please him. So friends, there, there's work to be done. There's work to be done. I was uh, talking to a pastor who serves in another part of the country and we were talking about basic expectations of our jobs and I happened to mention how many hours a week we tend to work here at Christ's Covenant. And he said, man, that's a lot. I would run out of stuff to do. And I was like, what? <laughs> We're dealing with sinners, <laughs> fellow sinners and fellow sufferers. Uh, the, the job's never done, right? Just didn't know how to take that comment. And just to be clear, uh, your job of speaking into my life is never done. 
Friends, we need one another. We are working together with God in doing one another's spiritual good. We're not apostles, but we have been sent. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. So you have a divine commissioning from Jesus himself to be his very ambassadors, God making his appeal through you. And specific to the Corinthians, they needed correction. Uh, It's like they're running headlong, about to fall over the edge of a cliff, and Paul is mercifully standing in front of them saying, stop. This is the Christian life at times. This is what we're called to. This is the cruciform life. Number two, make an appeal to others to receive the grace of God. Paul actually says, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Now, what does that mean? He's already said in verse 20 above, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. As Tom said last week, uh, we have to see this as Paul speaking directly to the Corinthians. If you look at verse 11 in our passage, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. So there's no doubt, uh, this is not a general call to the world to receive the grace of God. Paul is speaking directly to this church. When you tell anyone, be reconciled to God, or if you say, receive the grace of God, those statements presuppose a problem between God and the person you're talking to. Grace is only given and received if there is some offense that needs Covering some dark stain that needs cleansing. We call it sin. And sin can only be cleansed one way. Paul has just beautifully stated what God has done in Christ. He says, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made Jesus to bear the full weight and guilt of our sin so that we could be forgiven and we could have a righteous standing with God. This is the gospel of the grace of God. But Paul says, don't receive it in vain. Are they not believers? Have they not been sealed with the Holy Spirit? Is he not talking to the church of God that is at Corinth with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia. So clearly he's speaking to a people who have, who have received the good news of, of this gospel. But there is a kind of receiving that comes to no purpose. It, it comes to nothing. When a person puts their trust in Jesus Christ, there is a decisive turning away from the world and a clinging to Christ that takes place, a switching of allegiances, but it's a turning that should happen again and again and again over the course of your life. Not perfectly, but nevertheless steadily in the right direction with setbacks and yet pressing on, the true Christian will persevere. The problem in Corinth is that some in this church are still listening to false teaching, false apostles who question Paul's legitimacy as an apostle of Christ. These these men are worldly. They are flashy orators who, who are in love with money and public prestige. So Paul is now beginning to wonder, oh, Corinthians, which Christ did you receive? Is he Christ crucified? Or is he someone else? If they reject Paul because he's poor and unimpressive and he suffers too much, then how have they received Christ who was poor and suffered and died on a cross? Unless they reconcile with Paul, they prove to have fallen under the spell of these teachers and they have abandoned the gospel of the grace of God. Paul writes in chapter 11, I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, 
your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. See, Paul knows this church has that tendency. So he's unsure about them. It's it's why he's writing with, with such urgency. He quotes from Isaiah. God says, in a favorable time, I listened to you. And in a day of salvation, I have helped you. So so God is speaking to to the suffering servant there in Isaiah, who represents all of Israel, and and God assures him of a coming salvation. You notice that God speaks in what we call the the prophetic perfect. Uh, It's how certain the promise is. He, He speaks of it as if it's already happened. The promise was not just that Israel would be delivered from exile in Babylon. No, God says in the same passage, I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. There is a greater salvation coming for all nations that will encompass the entire earth. Paul says in Christ, that day has come. There was a necessary waiting and hoping for that day, but it has come. The new age, it's it's broken into the present. Just as the servant is an individual figure who represents all of Israel, Christ is an individual man who binds to himself all who believe in him. This is what it means to be in union with Christ. If you are bound to Christ, his crucifixion is your crucifixion. And friends, this is good news. Chapter 5, verse 14, one has died for all, therefore all have died. So in Christ, God counts your old life as ended. You've already died. Your sins have been nailed to the cross. His death is your death. His resurrection is your resurrection. His salvation is your salvation. The grace of God offered in Christ is overwhelmingly sufficient, and it's available right now. Paul is emphatic. He says, behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of of salvation. So there is an urgent need to be made right with God, and the window is now open by His grace. There should be no delay. I can't tell you how many college students I talked to in my days in campus ministry who in some sense were convinced of what I was saying, that there was a God in heaven to whom they were accountable and yet, they would say, you know, I'll get, I'll get spiritual later in life, you know. When I, when I get married, get a job, have kids, you know, but I, I'm young. I, I've, I've got a lot of years ahead of me. That's almost verbatim what I, what I would hear from students. It was jaw-dropping presumption and arrogance and really at heart a prideful defiance of God. I want to be my own God. I mean, I'll give lip service to God. You know, this was Georgia Tech, Atlanta, Georgia. It's in the South. It's kind of, this was late 90s. It was still kind of, a, you know, cultural Christianity is still very much in view. So I'll, I'll give lip service to God. Sure, there's a God in heaven, and in some sense, uh, I'm accountable to him. But uh, my heart, my desires, my will, my choices, those are mine. Maybe some of you, if you're honest with yourself, operate with that kind of mindset. You know, I'm, I'm doing fine right now. I'm doing my own thing. You know, me and God, we're good. We're good. Oh, well, we are experts at deceiving ourselves. Remember the warning from Hebrews. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. 
there is such a thing as spurious faith. False faith. It's not what it purports to be. It's inauthentic. You may externally carry some of the signs of true faith, what might look like true faith, but time will tell. A tree will be known by its fruit. Are you truly clinging to Jesus Christ for your very life, or are you just playing some kind of a game with God? Have you been led away listening to other voices, other teachings? There's a lot out there on the internet. So friends, we've got to care for one another. We've got to listen to one another. We've got to watch over one another. As fellow members of this body, you have a great interest in the outcome of your brother's life or your sister's life. James writes, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Paul cared deeply about the spiritual welfare of the Corinthians, and so he makes an appeal, don't receive the grace of God in vain. Number three, put no obstacle in anyone's way. You see that in verse three. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. Well, what, what kind of obstacles is he talking about? Unlike the false apostles, Paul didn't charge the Corinthians for his teaching. Uh, he refused to be a burden to them. He says, we have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. He writes in chapter 1, we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity. He mentions labors and sleepless nights in verse 5. We know that in other cities that Paul would work uh, building tents day and night so as to not be a financial burden on the people he was ministering to. The whole point is to not put any kind of stumbling block in someone's way, or do anything that would allow someone to find fault with your life and message. I mean, the gospel is its own offense, right? I had a missionary friend. He said, we may be the aroma of death to non-believers, but we don't have to be bad breath, (laughs) right? So we walk in integrity before people. We don't defraud people. We keep a clean conscience out of reverence for Christ. Number four, endure suffering by the power of God. Uh, You see there in uh, verses four through five, and then again, eight through 10, Paul catalogs some of the trials he had to endure to minister the gospel to others. Uh, He says, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. And then he begins a list of sufferings. You know, from a human perspective, that's a strange way to commend yourself. You know, as, a, as I work together with God, as a servant of God, I endure a lot of suffering. You know, you know the world would say, you're, you're out of your mind. You know, that, that's weak and pathetic. And what does that say about the God you, you claim to serve? Well, Paul would say, what we are is known to God. He'd say, our sufferings display our Lord who also suffered and was raised, just as he will raise us. He would say, we we know the one who said, let light shine out of darkness. He'd say, this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So the suffering is temporary, and it can't even be compared with the glory that's coming. Again, Paul's sufferings embodied the sufferings of Christ, the very one that that he's holding out to people. So you can see how how that would teach, how that would persuade. Suffering is part and parcel of the work. The false apostles saw his suffering as disqualifying. Paul considered it essential to the office. His suffering demonstrated that he was a true apostle of Christ and was sustained by God's power. 
with his weakness on display, the power and grace of God shined forth. That's how it works. You notice in verse 4, he begins the list with the phrase, by great endurance. Great endurance. That highlights the severity of the trials he experienced and the power of God that sustained him through it. In afflictions, hardships, calamities. So he first describes general trials. Uh, The word there for hardships could be translated in pressing needs. Uh, Calamities is uh, restricted circumstances. You're in a tight spot. So so the terms, that they they cast a wide net, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the word various in James chapter 1. Trials of various kinds. Sometimes we think, Lord, do you see even this? I don't know what to even do with this. I don't know anyone that's going through this or has been through something like this. But I'm in it right now. And Lord, you see and you know. Verse 5, beatings, imprisonments, riots. So these are trials inflicted by others on him. And note that each word is in the plural. You know, if you read Acts, uh, at this point in Paul's missionary travels, Luke records for us only one beating and only one imprisonment. Well, apparently there were multiple beatings. Paul, uh, Luke didn't record everything for us. He didn't tell us everything that happened. Again, none of it is lost or uncounted under the eyes of God. Labors, sleepless nights, hunger. These are self-inflicted trials, forms of self-discipline that at times they're, they're just necessary to carry out the work. So you step back and you think, how could possi- uh, Paul possibly suffer all these things and yet keep plodding on? By great endurance, only by the power of God. So, so do you see how God is put on display in the suffering of his saints? Paul said he was always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. So in your own life, is the gospel revealed in the way you respond to suffering? How is Christ commended to others when you're in pain? How could you testify later this afternoon at our members meeting at at the end? uh, We're going to have an open testimony time. And perhaps a few of you could stand and testify to God's sustaining power in your life as you pass through a great trial. Maybe you're still in it. So think about that this afternoon as we look to the, the members meeting. As you put all this together in your mind, you might say, you know, how can Paul say now is the day of salvation, but he and all the rest of us continue to suffer? How do you put that together? There is a required waiting upon the Lord. Just Old Testament saints, just like them, that they waited for the promised Messiah, we wait for his return. Now Christ has come, and here we have this tension of, of the The already, but the not yet. His resurrection was the beginning of the end time resurrection. He is the first fruits of a future harvest yet to come. The new age has already broken into our fallen world, and one day it will be fully consummated. And so for that, we wait in hope. But this coming salvation would not be accomplished except through the cross. This is what the Corinthians didn't seem to understand. The the teachers they had allowed in would have none of the suffering. And that represents a rejection of the gospel. It's an expression of unbelief. Because if you'll have none of the suffering, you will have none of the promised comfort. Remember from chapter 1, for as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. One scholar said, comfort is given only to those who know trouble. 
If a crucified Messiah offends you, then you will have no part in him. So the list of sufferings should have stirred up the Corinthians' love for Paul, and no doubt that was part of his thinking. He was their father in the faith. He's desperate for them to grasp the full uh, nature of the gospel with all clarity. A fifth way we learn in this passage to magnify Christ as servants of God in our ministry to others, practice the gifts and virtues of the Spirit. We have here a list of inward qualities and gifts of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Holy Spirit himself is listed. This is uh, verses 6 through 7. Paul mentions knowledge. I don't, I don't think that's intellectual abilities as much as it's Christian tactfulness and knowing how to seize up a, a situation and respond accordingly with wisdom. He says patience. That, that's long-suffering with the, the insults and weaknesses and sins of other people. Uh, he writes kindness. Uh, you know, if patience is passive, kindness would be that proactive, doing others good. Genuine love. Paul's love is unfeigned, and that comes across crystal clear in his letter. His sincerity is unquestioned. Uh, but when, you, when you speak gently and yet frankly with someone, that's a sign of authentic love. You know, the Proverbs says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. A true friend who loves you from the heart won't flatter you. Uh, he'll speak the truth to you. That, that, that's the very next phrase, by truthful speech. So Paul was so free in Christ, he wasn't a people pleaser. No, he actually loved the Corinthians and he wanted to do them spiritual good, so he spoke the truth to them even if it caused them grief. This, this is a point of reflection for us. Do we love each other like that? With a genuine love? Do you speak the truth with your neighbor? Or are you tempted to flattery or maybe downplaying the real issues that need to be addressed? Verse 11, Paul says, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. That's a picture of genuine love. Paul also writes, the Holy Spirit, as a reason he can commend his life and ministry to this church. The Holy Spirit, of course, is the very source and power behind any virtue in the Christian life. So these things, they don't, they don't spring naturally out of Paul. They come from the Spirit's work in him. Love, patience, kindness, these are fruits of the Spirit. We're commanded to be filled with the Spirit, which is an ongoing filling. It's a moment-by-moment -moment reliance on the Spirit to be governed and empowered by Him. And finally, Paul is also equipped with weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Now, he's just mentioned the Holy Spirit and some of the fruits of the Spirit. So if your minds are drawn to the armor of God... For spiritual battle, I think we're on good footing to assume he means the sword of the Spirit for the right hand and the shield of faith for the left. The sword would be an offensive weapon, the shield a defensive weapon. Paul is fully equipped by God for any situation that may arise. Uh, just as Kevin prayed, surely we have been given every spiritual blessing by God to, to effectively minister to other people. Lastly, number six, glory in the hidden ways of God. In verse eight, Paul lists several pairs of contrasting ways the world may perceive us, but his life and ministry are still commendable for the sake of Christ, whatever the circumstance. He writes, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as imposters and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known. Again, Paul would say what we are is known to God. Paul rested in the knowledge that he was known by God, however he may be perceived by people. He was content with dishonor and scorn and slander because that's precisely what happened to Jesus. To be conformed to Christ would mean a cruciform life, a cross-shaped life. 
Suffering was to be expected, but that's not all that's going on. In verse 9, he shifts to the beautiful, mysterious realities of the Christian life, these hidden ways of God. He says, as dying, and behold, we live, as punished, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. The theologian David Garland, he writes this, the first element is connected to the brief and shadowy realities affecting a clay vessel. The second element is related to the presence of the all-surpassing power from God in his life. This is the Christian life. These two things, these pairs, as you read them, they, they come in parallel, don't they? At the same time, simultaneously, throughout our lives. Paul was indeed unknown in the world's eyes. He was dying, he was punished, he had sorrow, he was poor, he had nothing. But that's not all that's going on. And this is the glory of it. What appears foolish and weak and humble and low and despised in the eyes of the world, God is pleased to use for the sake of his glory. The Bible is full of these these divine reversals. Paul says he is found as dying, and behold, we live. Again and again he is beaten and whipped and stoned. One time he was dragged out of the city and left for dead. In fact, they thought he was dead. The disciples, they gather around him, and the text says he rose up, and he walked right back into the city. It's a picture of the resurrection. Paul's life was a picture of the death and resurrection of Christ. Yes, he had sorrow, but running right alongside it was joy. Notice Paul, he's he's not always sorrowful. It doesn't say that, but he is always rejoicing. He's a poor man in the eyes of the world, but clearly he has made many rich and the knowledge of the grace of God. He may have few earthly possessions, but spiritually speaking, he possesses all things because he has Christ. In my reading, one author pointed out the remarkable connections between this passage and the Beatitudes. So if you have the text in front of you from Corinthians, looking at verse 4 through 5, I just want you to listen to Jesus' words from Matthew 5. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you look at verse 6 and listen. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Verse 8. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Looking at verse 10. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Friends, a cruciform life commends and embodies a crucified Savior. His death and resurrection is the very story of our lives. So with great endurance, hold it out to people, appealing to them to receive the grace of God. Let's pray. Oh, Lord. May this word of yours dwell richly in us. May we be rightly warned, but also deeply comforted. Empower us with your spirit to minister to others and to one another. Lord, we need your help. Thank you for your grace. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.